Hydroelectric dams helped shape and help power New England. Now their owners are facing pushback. This is our river, and it's our water. They don't own it, but they use it to create profits for their business. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. Travel with us along the Connecticut River as we hear ideas about what to do with these dams. And what do you do when the changing coast threatens your home? Where do you decide to draw the line and, and make a stand? Do you have a right to protect your property, to protect your family? We visit a small island that's looking toward the future. Also, do you love our New England landscape? Well, thank a beaver. Beavers, too, have permanently shaped the course of biology and geology. They have reformed rivers, needed meadows, filled valleys. We built our civilization atop the sediment they left behind. Coming up, we learn from the master dam builders. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm John Dankosky. Thanks for joining us. This week, we're going to revisit some of our favorite recent stories that help to explain New England's environment and its energy needs. And we're going to start on the long tidal river that stretches from the border with Canada to Long Island Sound. The Connecticut is our region's largest river and long a source of power as well as commerce and recreation. A group of hydroelectric dams along the river in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts are undergoing a once-in-a-generation process of federal relicensing. Residents who live near these dams are hoping that the company that owns them will take the opportunity to not only utilize hydroelectric power, but also to protect local wildlife and maybe even make it a better space for outdoor activities like whitewater paddling. New Hampshire Public Radio's Annie Ropeek takes us on a tour of some of the dams around our region and talks with people who live, work, and play nearby about what they hope might change. Steve Stocking has farmed the banks of the Connecticut River in Fairleigh, Vermont, for 50 years. He took me to the edge of his cornfields in early May to see the river and what he feels nearby dams have done to his land. The slope falls down, especially when it soaks up with water from high levels, and then it runs out quickly and it weakens the support and it sloughs, it sloughs down. Down here, we can see where the water has carved away the muddy banks. Now, rivers do cause erosion, but Stocking says the dams constantly raise and lower the water level more than is natural. And he thinks that's caused erosion 85 feet since he came here. To sit here and watch land that you pay taxes on and that you could grow corn on or, or crops on be sloughing off into the river you know, I don't know what to tell you if we would have, you know, bought it, but it was, it's what we did. Stocking's farm is 18 miles upriver from Wilder Dam near Dartmouth College. Stocking and others want to have a say in how much water the dam pulls down the river every day. And, you know, we'll have our chance now, and then there won't be another chance for another 50 years. This is Kathy Erfer with the Connecticut River Conservancy. She says this is a unique moment. Great River Hydro, the company that owns Wilder Dam and others, is seeking new federal licenses for three of its facilities. These permits are decades long, and Erfer says they spell out exactly how the dams will operate. Here at Wilder Dam, we can see those operations in action. And you can look upstream, and there is a pretty calm pool of water that looks like a lake. <laughs> and then if you look downstream, and you might be able to hear the water flowing, um, what you see is the water coming through the dam. You know, there's basically like white water below the dam that then is flowing down. As that water flows, it runs through turbines that create electricity. Great River Hydro holds back some or all of the river's flow every day until the time is right to sell power. Then they open the floodgates. Further south is Bellows Falls Dam, another that's up for relicensing. Kathy Erfer shows me how excess spring meltwater is rushing through a channel on the side of the dam called a bypass. You know, one of the things that we would like to see is uh, water in this bypass all the time, right? And basically restoring the habitat here in this section of the river. Erfer wants more protections for fish and mussels at the dams and in their flow rates. She also wants people to have better access to the river. Right now, the dams are kind of foreboding. We keep passing warning signs as we walk around Bellows Falls. So the sign says, warning, changing water levels. Be constantly alert for water level increases 
Water upstream may be released at any time. People who are into whitewater paddling think this area could be made just safe enough to be really fun. They even had Great River Hydro do an official study where the dam released different amounts of water and paddlers tested them out. John Raganes is in charge of this whole process for Great River Hydro. He says he's here to work with everyone the dams affect, but his company and others disagree with those who say the dams are causing widespread erosion on the Connecticut. Raganese says that's based on a misconception about how much the dams control the river. He says they can adjust the water level right at the dam, but you wouldn't see the same fluctuations miles upstream. We cannot control the flow. The flow is what the flow is. We just take advantage of the flow. Still, some groups want Great River Hydro to put money in a fund to fix erosion. They've done that for other dams, but Raganese wouldn't comment on whether that'll be part of this relicensing process. No matter what, he says, they need to preserve the dam's flexibility, because these are the kind of plants that have to kick on fast if there's a problem elsewhere in the electric system. Our mandate is is larger than uh, how can we extract the highest amount of dollars from the water. We have a responsibility. That's why we have the license to provide a power resource that is needed to the New England grid. This is my first paddle of the year. It feels like I just got out of the boat last fall. Norm Sims is an avid paddler who works on relicensing for the Appalachian Mountain Club as a volunteer. He took me canoeing recently just below Vernon Dam, the last Great River Hydro facility on the New Hampshire-Vermont border that's up for relicensing. We're in a hundred-year-old wood and canvas canoe. Sims is a collector. And it's a beautiful, sunny day for a paddle. We glide past bucolic scenery, islands, and secret waterfalls. Sims keeps getting distracted by birds. And at first, it's easy going. We're paddling with the current and the wind. But then the river starts to push back. So you notice how it feels like we're not moving very fast? We may be entering the backwater from the Turner's Falls Dam which would be disappointing because we have miles to go before we sleep. When the next dam down isn't running, the water above it turns flat, which makes paddling harder. Still, Sims doesn't feel the dams are an obstacle to enjoying the river. In relicensing, he's working on improving routes for boaters to carry their vessels around the dams. And he's excited about the idea of new whitewater at Bellows Falls. He says he values the electricity the dams generate. But this is our river, and it's our water. They don't own it, but they use it to create profits for their business. And what we're talking about in relicensing is that they pay a little rent on their fuel. And, you know, generally they know they're going to do that. Relicensing for these dams has been going on since 2012. Federal regulators are expected to keep evaluating the studies and proposals involved through at least 2019. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Annie Ropeek. Renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and hydro are muscling their way into the country's energy mix, but they're all still pretty unpredictable, creating significant management challenges and big swings in electricity prices. But there's a small island several miles off Maine's coast that just might have a solution. Islanders and engineers are using artificial intelligence, complex algorithms, and a bootstrapping attitude to design what they're calling the next, next electricity grid. Maine Public Radio's Fred Bever explains how. You can only reach Isle of Ho, a part of Acadia National Park that's about six miles out from the mainland, by boat. On the way, you can see red-lettered signs warning mariners of an underwater cable. It's the one that brings electricity to the island, and the cable is 17 years beyond its predicted life. It can wear out at any moment. You know, if that cable failed, it would be a disaster for the island. Stephen Strong is one of a group of engineers, scientists, and islanders trying to avert that disaster. Their solution is a flexible microgrid, an array of island-based energy generators and storage systems that will keep the lights on and houses warm when that cable fails. And they're trying to do it for less than the $1.7 million cost of a new cable. And the microgrid is less expensive, and they keep the money on the island when they're done. Strong is lead engineer for an electricity system that will be anchored by a half-acre field of solar panels. It'll also include some pretty massive batteries, electric heat pumps that can store excess energy in basement water tanks, and as a kind of safety net for it all, a diesel generator. 
On a visit to the shed housing that generator, scientist Kay Aiken playfully half closes a door on the project collaborators. We'll lock them in. <laughs> You're not getting out until we have a micro break. <laughs> Aiken's Portland based company, Introspective Systems, designs software for artificial intelligence networks that can manage complex systems or really teach them to manage themselves. It's like building an engineered ecosystem. This is my laboratory. The company has a million dollar grant from the U.S. Department of Energy to design an electricity ecosystem that's run by artificial intelligence. On Isla Ho, AI computer chips will let solar panels, batteries, heat pumps, and the lot decide for themselves when to make energy, when to take it, use it, or store it, depending on what's most cost effective. Company co founder Carol Johnson says the island's smart energy assets will compete and cooperate, sort of the way swamp-dwelling frogs and snakes do. A frog has a perspective that involves not being eaten by a snake. A snake is quite different, you know, how do I catch frogs? Yet the sometimes warring impulses of frogs and snakes taken together help keep a swamp balanced, even in the face of complex and swiftly changing conditions. The decisions that are made by the entities in the swamp are all independent, but the result is a stable ecosystem. And so that's what we're trying to achieve in, in terms of the systems we design, computationally stable ecosystems. Such as a self-controlling microgrid on Isla Ho. And you can scale it up, linking one microgrid to another and another, then to the electrical network for a region, all the way up to the entire nation's grid. Instead of today's centralized command and control system, the next next grid would be decentralized. It would be controlled, says Kay Aiken, from the grid's edges by the collective decisions of the electrical swamps, frogs and snakes. It's AI enabled devices. And you can do the very fine control with thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of devices without a supercomputer that will more effectively respond to the multiplex of non-polluting energy sources that are proliferating around the country, she says. And if any one section of the system suffers a catastrophe, maybe from a storm, maybe a cyber attack, it can quickly be shut off from the rest. It's more reliable, it's more robust, it's resilient, failures are isolated. For the president of the island's electricity company, Jim Wilson, a sophisticated vision for a renewable energy future is all well and good. But the bottom line is that the local experiment will protect islanders against the unaffordable cost of replacing an old underwater cable. At a minimum, it prevents a collapse of the population. But down the road, we should have very stable prices and maybe even competitive with the mainland. Wilson says the collaborators hope to get this small model for what eventually could be major change in the nation's energy systems up and running by New Year's Eve. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Fred Bever in Portland, Maine. You can hear more stories like Annie's and Fred's about the future of renewable energy in our series, The Big Switch. It's at nenc.news. Coming up, coastal communities in New England adapt to rising sea levels. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. Sea levels are rising at a fast pace, affecting lives around the country and around the world. Elizabeth Rush grapples with the impact that sea level rise has on the people, animals, ecosystems, and landscapes in the U.S. in her new book called Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore. She joins us now. Elizabeth, welcome to Next. Thanks for having me. I'm wondering if you could start with a, a brief reading for us from your book. Absolutely. I'll read from a section that is actually in the first chapter of the book. And I think the only thing you need to know going into it is that towards the end of this passage, I meditate on a word, tupelo. And it's a kind of tree that, particularly in Rhode Island, but also all up and down the East Coast, when they're sighted atop tidal wetlands, they're starting to drown and die. 
And so this comes in the middle of this chapter where I've been spending a lot of time amongst these drowning Tupelo trees here in Rhode Island. Five times in the history of the Earth, nearly all life has winked out. The planet undergoing a series of changes so massive, the overwhelming majority of living species died. These great extinctions are so exceptional, they even have a catchy name, the Big Five. Today, seven out of ten scientists believe that we're in the middle of the sixth. But there is one thing that distinguishes those past die-offs from the one we're currently constructing. Never before have humans been there to tell the tale. The language we use to narrate our experience in the world can awaken in us the knowledge that transformation is both necessary and ongoing. When we say the word Tupelo, we begin to see that both the trees themselves and the very particular ecology they once depended upon are, at least where they are rooted, gone. Sometimes a key arrives before the lock. Now I'm thinking, sometimes the password arrives before the impasse. These words, when spoken or written down, might grant us entry into a previously unimaginable awareness that the coast and all the living beings on it are changing radically. It's a sobering thought that you leave us with early in this book, and I want to get to some of the specifics of that sobering message, but I want to get back to that word Tupelo. Tell us more about the Tupelo tree and why you use this metaphor. Well, it's a metaphor, I think, that presented itself to me physically. During my first weeks of living here in Rhode Island, I I moved up from New York City, and I took an interest in the tidal marshes of Rhode Island, in part because I had been writing about sea level rise for quite some time. And I know that tidal marshes are one of the most endangered, most vulnerable ecosystems we have to climate change. And so I started visiting these marshes in Rhode Island to see if they were showing the early signs of sea level rise. And Of course they were. And the way that sea level rise, I think, is in some ways most immediately manifest for the everyday outdoor appreciator or environmental enthusiast is that if you go to tidal marshes around the country, you'll see often these ghostly silhouettes, these trees, these hardwood trees that have died because they're starting to suck up salt water through their root systems. And so here in Rhode Island, a tupelo is a common tree that you'll see along the coast in tidal marsh ecosystems. But in a place like Louisiana, you'll see cypress and live oak. And in all of these locations all around the country, hardwood trees that live in this particular ecology are struggling and perishing because of sea level rise. What was something that happened in your life, a single event that maybe woke you up to the reality of sea level rise? I know it's something that you ask people in the book. For me, it was really teaching at the College of Staten Island during Hurricane Sandy. Our campus remained closed for many weeks after the storm. And when we reopened again, quite a few of my students were missing. And that's when I realized that in this sly and difficult to locate way, sea level rise was already starting to dismantle, change, upend many of our coastal communities But I felt like that story wasn't really being told in the news media. That's a place that you used to tell the story of of retreating from the sea, something that's a big part of the story. What did Staten Island do to cope with rising sea levels in that way? So what followed after Hurricane Sandy was really a surprise for me. Many coastal communities in Staten Island have had long, persistent flooding problems, and they've always found themselves at the bottom of the municipal to-do list. And so as time went on, we got two, three, four months out of out from the storm itself, and they had yet to receive any real relief from the federal, state, or municipal level. And so coastal communities all across Staten Island, nine in total, started organizing themselves. They came together, started a grassroots buyout campaign, And they built consensus from the ground up and then went to the state's governor to ask that a hazard mitigation grant program buyout be used to help residents move away from risk. And and it was granted in three out of those nine communities. 
I, I'm wondering if writing about a big extinction event that this perhaps could be is is worrisome to you, it makes you nervous about uh, how the world is changing. Well, something that I heard in writing Rising was through a conversation that I had and that my students had, again, at Bates College, with a Penobscot historian and scholar, John Bear Mitchell. And I thought to myself, here's a man who's part of this native group of people and who probably has really interesting insights into how do you live through times of tremendous environmental change. Certainly the Penobscot, who were here for many thousands of years before colonists arrived, the coming of the colonists was, in effect, a massive transformation of the plants, the animals, the land where they had long made their lives. And I wanted to know, how did they deal with that? What John Bear Mitchell said really surprised me. He said, learn the names now so you can hold on to them in your collective memory, in your collective history, even if the objects or the animals or the plants no longer exist. And so I took that very seriously to heart as I was writing this book and and thought about how important it is for us to have language to describe the things that we might fundamentally lose in the coming centuries. I love that approach, though. You, you're a writer and you're preserving language. You're not approaching this as a scientist who goes and does core samples in the Arctic to chart how the climate is changing. You're actually uh, mining something a little bit different. I, I feel like that's important. And I, I haven't, Elizabeth, heard too many people who, who are doing that type of, I don't know, linguistic archaeology. <laughs> uh, I, I think it, it feels important somehow. I do as well. And I think it's in part, you know, my work is fundamentally dependent upon those scientists. Really, rising wouldn't exist without their work. And yet, I know that for the everyday person, engaging with the language of those scientific reports can be daunting, overwhelming, arresting, and also essentially sort of create a threshold where folks don't necessarily engage with them because it's a little bit starts to sound like insider baseball. And so I wanted to really write a book that um, used language that was both given to me by folks living through these changes from their observations, um, using their eyes on the ground to describe what was happening, and that also then could use poetry and lyricism to speak to a broader audience all across the country. I think that some people, as you would say, look at the science behind climate change as a bit of inside baseball. I think that there's a certain number of people who view it as something that's just not happening and they want to deny the presence of the facts that you lay out. But I think that there's a third category that we might want to guard against, which is people who, who feel so profoundly beaten down by a type of reality they see hitting them right between the face that Yes, we're slowly killing the planet, and it's all incredibly hopeless. I'm wondering if you have to fight back against that. It's just so hopeless. Why do you even bother? Well, I think it's interesting. I think a lot of our public discourse around climate change certainly tended towards the apocalyptic mm -hmm. over the past decade or so. And I think that was done out of this real deep desire to get folks aware that it was happening and to care about it. And I think... As we can see over the past more recent time, two or three years, more newspapers, more radio stations are doing climate change coverage. And so I think that means that it's also time for us to think about new stories that we can tell about climate change, because certainly the apocalyptic ones lead to a sense of despondency and despair. I think Rising tries to do that in a really fundamental way by telling the stories of folks who are living through persistent flooding, higher tides, stronger storms, and asking what do they do when the ground beneath their feet starts to disappear? I found a lot of hope in the fact that they were individually, collectively figuring out how to move away from what made them vulnerable, how to move away from risk. So you feel hopeful? I feel both hope and probably tremendous anxiety. I think that what 
concerns me the most is going back to that question of social and environmental justice. I think human beings can and will be able to make these changes. However, I also know that history tells me that the most vulnerable amongst us will feel the negative impacts the most profoundly, the earliest. And if we don't do something to start to think about funding more equitable disaster recovery and resilience, um, then I think we're all participating in that unjust and unwarranted assault on, on the vulnerable people and plants and animals that we live amongst. The book is called Rising, Dispatches from the New American Shore, and the author is Elizabeth Rush, who lives in Rhode Island, where she teaches creative nonfiction at Brown University. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you. Rising sea levels are also raising concern on Plum Island in Massachusetts. WBUR's Simone Rios takes us to the island, where residents are taking matters into their own hands, and they're doing it in very different ways, a contrast in what designers call green versus gray engineering. On the northern tip of Plum Island, a few dozen volunteers sink shovels into a mound of sand. They're digging 10,000 holes to plant 20,000 stalks of beach grass. The grass will nourish a berm put in place after a series of devastating storms over the winter. Local activist Vern Ellis says it's the only thing environmental officials will allow him to use, sand and beach grass. He knows it's an effort worthy of a Don Quixote, but he hopes the beach grass buys his little La Mancha a bit of time. The grass um, grows really, really deep roots, three, four feet down, and it spreads. And it basically holds the sand in place. And this stuff is really resilient. It could get buried up to about a foot of sand and it will come back up through it. Ellis and his neighbors live on Reservation Terrace, a dozen shoreline houses at a flashpoint in Plum Island's struggle against erosion. He organized his neighbors to buy and plant the beach grass in the hundred feet of sand that separates their houses from the ocean. Ellis says the grass planting comes in response to a massive movement in the sand at the mouth of the Merrimack River, which opens to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, it's kind of funny because when we first moved here, there was 400 more feet of dunes out into the river. So you're not going back 50 years in family history, you're going back five years? Yeah, yeah. The cause of the erosion is a matter of debate. Some residents blame a jetty repair project conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers five years ago. The Army Corps attributes the erosion to natural cycles. Regardless of the cause, Vern Ellis and others on Reservation Terrace say four-fifths of their beach has been washed away. Up near the New Hampshire border, Plum Island is an island of sand, one of 681 so-called barrier beaches in Massachusetts, with ocean on one side and a bay, marsh, or other body of water on the other. It's a landform in flux, and as Ellis and his neighbors are witnessing, not just in geological time. Yeah, it's coming. The erosion is coming. But, you know, we only have, you know, 20, 30 more years here on planet Earth and might as well enjoy it while we can. Plum Island is a case study in how Massachusetts communities are reacting to a changing ocean. The prospect of rising sea levels makes it all the more critical. A recent report found 90,000 homes along the coast could face chronic flooding by the end of the century, some of them in the coming decades. Vern Ellis' beach grass is what's considered green infrastructure, a tread-lightly approach trying to enhance and complement the natural environment. Others on Plum Island are committed to the more permanent, hardened solutions of walls and barriers, known as gray infrastructure. My name is Bob Connors. Bob Connors and Vern Ellis are a yin and yang of DIY coastal resiliency. Where Ellis lives on a public beach, Connors owns the beach in front of his house. Where Ellis received approval from the authorities to plant beach grass, Connors went against the state. He led his neighborhood in constructing massive stone barriers along the beach, known as rip-raps. Connors says he had no choice. All hell has just broken loose up here. That's Connors back in 2013, talking to Channel 5 as a winter storm pounded his neighborhood. We've got several homes now that have been compromised. One has actually gone in. Uh, it's collapsed onto the beach. And another one to my left, uh, his foundation was just compromised. 
Connor says the state was threatening to issue huge fines if he and his neighbors went against coastal building rules and put up riprap's in front of their homes. But a storm of political pressure and media scrutiny ensued on behalf of the neighbors, and the state backed down. Government timeline never matches that of Mother Nature when you're having a natural disaster. If we had tried to go through the normal permitting process and then trying to overcome the, 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 the nays and the yays of whether you should or shouldn't do it, uh, we would have lost probably 40 homes. Five years later, and Connor says the riprap's are doing their job, though that requires constantly replacing rocks dislodged by the waves. Connor says it's worth the tens of thousands of dollars it costs him. He sees his neighborhood as the front line of an existential battle against the ocean. We're trying to defend our property, but in the meantime, we're also defending the infrastructure of our roadway. We're defending the Great Marsh. If, if Plum Island or other barriers weren't here, the Great Marsh would be gone. So where do you decide to draw the line and, and make a stance? Do you have a right to protect your property, to protect your family? Some on Plum Island see Connors as a renegade. What if everybody shirked the rules and built walls along the beach? Others say it's a task of Sisyphus, the Greek king forced to roll a boulder up a hill for eternity, only to see it roll back down. I think while it works, it's absolutely buying time. Greg Moore is an ecologist from the University of New Hampshire. Standing in front of the riprap near Connor's neighborhood, Moore says he teaches his students about the green approach of Ellis and the gray approach of Connor's. This is gray infrastructure, right? This is taking an engineered solution of gray stones and putting it in place. And when we plant dune grass on the dunes, that's our green infrastructure. And, you know, perhaps there's a way to marry those two technologies together to protect a system. You, you've got to applaud, I guess, people for doing what they can within their capacity to protect their resource. I, I can't predict if this is going to be sustainable. At some of the locations, it's not been enough. Right now, today, on a beautiful sunny day, it looks like it's working. But Moore says these days, a disastrous storm is always right around the corner for Plum Island. And if the trend doesn't break, and the projections of several feet of sea level rise are accurate, Moore says some on Plum Island will have to consider retreat. As a scientist, he sees the cataclysms underway as inevitable. But as someone who's been playing on the island since he was a kid, and who spent years doing research here with the blessing of the residents, he's not ready to watch the homes fall into the ocean. When it's your property, when it's your home, it's very hard to separate the cold, say, harsh, truth of, of science against, you know, some homeowners here who've lived there their whole life. And it's very difficult to, to give up the fight for them. As for Vern Ellis at the mouth of the Merrimack, he decided to end the fight after the havoc of last winter. It was really hard because we love living there and it's just so beautiful. But after the storms in March, it washed over the dunes into the street all along Reservation Terrace. And that first storm in March, there were eight high tides, and it washed over every single high tide. And that's when you know, it's like, this is not good. Ellis plans to sell his dream house later this year, the one he built and moved into five years ago, and moved to downtown Newburyport. Of all the differences he shares with Bob Connors, perhaps that's the biggest of all. Connors doesn't plan on going anywhere. As this coastal crisis continues, government will, ad- will adapt, they'll adjust. Will everybody survive? Time will tell. The neighborhoods that are cohesive and act as a group will will survive. Those that are splinted and are thinking that everyone else is going to do it for them, um, time will tell. One thing Ellis and Connors agree on, they want the powers that beat to come up with an action plan for Plum Island and put up the money to execute it. But in a country that spends nine-tenths of its flood preparedness dollars after major floods, the piecemeal approach of gray and green infrastructure may be the last stand for Plum Island. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Simon Rios. And how do rising sea levels affect our drinking water? Well, hurricanes and other severe storms can push seawater toward the shore, and that water, called storm surge, can flood the streets and basements and potentially the coastal drinking wells. Rhode Island Public Radio's environment reporter Avery Brookins takes a look at how extreme weather events could threaten the quality of drinking water for thousands of coastal residents. Can you give me a hand? Wow. 
See? There's our well. Andrew Bear slides the cap off his well in his front lawn. It's a cement cylinder about 12 feet deep, and unlike those pictures you may have seen in storybooks, it doesn't have a pail and rope to get the water out. Instead, there's a pump inside that runs on electricity. And it pumps the water from that well into our basement. It goes into a pressure tank and then comes up into our plumbing. Bear and his wife live in a small house on Green Hill Pond in Charlestown, Rhode Island, less than a mile from the ocean. And the town has no water system, so the bears rely on their well for drinking, bathing, doing dishes, everything. And so far, Bear says that's been working out for them. We have no um, bacteria or chloroform or really any you know, any issues with our water, and it tastes delicious. But relying on water from a well can be risky, since it pumps out groundwater. It's not an isolated, magic, underground lake, none of that. That's Thomas Boving. He's a geosciences professor at the University of Rhode Island. Boving says groundwater isn't just there. It comes from the rain, and when it rains, the water seeps into the ground and gets trapped. And Boving says that trapped water is fresh water and typically very safe to drink. But it can get contaminated if there are too many chemicals on the surface, or even too much salt. Boving's colleague, Sony Pradnang, studies water quality. People have reported that they have had instances of where they had you know, salt, salty water in their well water immediately after um, these, you know, like uh, storm events. After Superstorm Sandy in 2012, several coastal wells in Charlestown were salted. That's the same town where Andrew Bear lives. And salted water is not like the added bonus of having salt on your pretzel. It can cause health problems like high blood pressure and heart attacks, just like a high sodium diet. Too much salt in your well makes it unusable, and this can happen even if you're far from the ocean. Pradnang says in New York, storm surge during Hurricane Irene in 2011 was so strong that even wells miles inland were contaminated with salt. The effect was, was seen in upstate, like in, close to Albany, uh, which is pretty far from, like mm-hmm. 100, almost 100 miles or more from the Hudson, you know, the Hudson River. In Charlestown, there is no plan for protecting wells in a big storm because you can't physically prevent salt water from seeping into the ground. Professor Boving says that happens when a storm causes a lot of flooding, mixing salty ocean water and fresh water from ponds. If a freshwater system gets replaced by a saltwater system, then that same water, that salt water, will now, instead of the fresh water, recharge the groundwater, bringing in the salt, causing a problem. And the problem could become more common as climate change causes stronger hurricanes. After a big storm, residents are now required to provide the town with well water samples to make sure it's still drinkable. And if it's not, they just have to drink bottled water until they can use their wells again. Boving and Professor Pradnang are working on a study to map out the potential impacts a big storm could have on coastal wells so residents can be aware of their risks. Boving says scientists aren't far enough into their research yet to know how severe the effects could be. But it's very likely that if it happens today, many people would be hurting because of their well being salted. Once the wells are contaminated, they can desalinate naturally, but it could take months before the water is fresh enough to drink again. And other alternatives for desalinating cost too much money money. But an even bigger concern for homeowner Andrew Bear is rising sea levels, which could permanently salt his well. We can kind of live with a catastrophic event and anticipate it's going to get better. But if it becomes really the chronic or sort of chronic repercussions of climate change and sea level rise are definitely going to be a big problem with our fresh water. Fresh water floats on top of salt water because it's less dense. And if sea levels rise, the salt water underground does too, pushing more salt into wells and making it harder to access enough fresh water. And Charlestown Town Council President Virginia Lee says the town doesn't have a plan to prevent wells from becoming permanently salted. She says that's because homeowners are responsible for the quality of their own well water. And the state, the Department of Health, doesn't regulate private wells, only public wells. So people are are on their own. Resident Andrew Bear knows of a street nearby where people can't use their wells and rely regularly on trucks to bring them their water. It's not clear whether climate change is the cause of that, but it gives Bear an idea of how he might have to live one day if rising sea levels salt his well. And he wants to see a more proactive approach to addressing the issue. We know we're in deep <laughs> let's put it that way, right? So we don't need more studies to figure that out. Town officials say they're aware of the problem and they're concerned about it. They recommend homeowners have their wells tested each year to make sure the water is still safe to drink. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Avery Brookins in Providence. Coming up, we'll learn about the master dam builders. Yes, beavers are next.
Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative and its coverage of climate and clean energy. Did you know that when Europeans first came to North America, there were about 400 million, that's right, 400 million American beavers around our continent? By 1900, thanks to the fur trapping industry, that population was down to about 100,000. And as beavers disappeared, the landscape of North America changed dramatically, and arguably for the worse. Ben Goldfarb tracks the environmental impact that beavers have on the world around them, as well as their unique history, in his new book, Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. He joins us to tell us about why he became a self-proclaimed beaver believer. He started by telling us why beavers are so important for the ecosystems that they're in. Of course, the fundamental beaver behavior, the thing we all know is they build dams, right? And those dams store huge amounts of water. They create ponds and wetlands. And historically, that's what many, many streams on this continent looked like. You know, it was just a series of beaver ponds, kind of the the crystalline, clear, free-flowing, narrow, shallow stream that we think of today, kind of the prototypical babbling brook, you know, really wasn't the, the rule in many places. You know, streams were much messier, filled with dead wood and decaying organic matter and silt, you know, instead of free-flowing streams, we had these chains of ponds and wetlands in many places. And that was really the handiwork of beavers. They, they created a, an entirely different ecosystem uh, than the one that we're accustomed to today when their populations are much reduced. Talk about the history of beavers in New England and how they shape the landscape that we have around here. Yeah, so, the, so New England is, was sort of the place where the fur trade began. You know, the first European colonists arrived here, and, and beavers were integral first to their economies. The pilgrims, the first colonists, owed money to their creditors back in Europe. And, uh, you know, one of the few ways they could repay those debts was by shipping beaver pelts back to the old world. So beavers, you know, really made, made the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Plymouth Colony possible. As those beavers got trapped out, their dams were no longer maintained, and the dams began to break down, and all of these ponds started draining out to the ocean. Uh, and what was left behind was this this rich layer of organic matter, these nice, flat, treeless, incredibly fertile footprints left behind by these derelict beaver ponds that had gone dry. And that was really some of the best farmland in the New World. That was incredibly rich, fertile soil in a, in a region that's generally pretty rocky and infertile. So beavers really helped make agriculture possible in the New World. So we talk about these large numbers, and then they're they're wiped out almost as as many other species have been very quickly because of, of human consumption in the late 18th century they're almost all gone how exactly did we bring them back how did they how did they return yeah so in the early 1900s we, we began to recognize that that beavers were actually these hugely important animals plus you know trappers wanted to hunt them again. You know, they'd lost an important source of, of pelts and income. So a, kind of a series of beaver relocation projects began all over the country. And in New England, we, you know, where beavers had been trapped out, the primary beaver source was actually the state of New York. In New York, you know, in, in 1904, the legislature passed this resolution basically calling for beaver reintroduction. The problem then was that, you know, there were there really no beavers to find, right? I mean, we were, you know, kind of at the, the beaver population nadir. It was hard to find a beaver at that point in history. So these New York state biologists went down to St. Louis for the Louisiana Purchase Centennial. It was this big sort of exposition celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. And down there, they bought seven seven live beavers from the Canadian delegation at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. And they took those beavers back up to New York. They got a few more from Yellowstone, and they relocated about 20 beavers in 1904 and 1905 to the, the waters of New York. By 1915, just 11 years later, that population had exploded to 15,000 beavers from a, a seed population of 20 or so, plus a few beavers that were there already. So, you know, later that decade and in the 1920s, you know, those beavers began to disperse out of New York, crossing state lines, entering Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont. And, uh, there, you know, there were a few introductions as well in New England, but, you know, a lot of the beavers we have in the Northeast are descendants of that New York state population. We've heard stories in recent years about scientists making a stand and saying we have to reintroduce species in various parts 
of the country in order to balance out the ecosystem. But that seems like a very early attempt at that that worked really well. Yeah, people, you know, people were were pretty beaver aware back then. I think it's one of the one of the interesting things for me as, I, as I've researched this book has been seeing, you know, today we recognize beavers as these hugely important ecosystem service providers, right? They store water for us. Their ponds filter out water pollution, improving water quality. You know, they, they reduce erosion. They slow down floods. They provide all these valuable services. And, uh, you know, people actually knew that back at, back in the early 1900s. There was this, this beaver awareness that we sort of lost again, I think, over the course of the 20th century. So the, those biologists were pretty, they were pretty sharp people. They, they got it. <laughs> there are some people that, that you, you talk to, uh, leading experts in beaver coexistence who live right here in New England, Mike Callahan and Skip Lyle, can you tell us who they are and what what they're doing exactly? So the traditional way that we handle beaver conflicts, you know, when when a beaver clogs up a road culvert, let's say, and, and washes out the road, is we just trap those beavers out. We kill the beavers. And, you know, that can that can work temporarily, but it has two main problems. One is that you're eliminating a lot of these great ponds and wetlands that the beavers are creating. And the, se- and the second problem is, you know, you're, you're really just putting up a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, <laughs> right? It's, as long as the habitat's good, they'll, fi- they'll find their way back there. Uh, so what, what Mike and Skip do is they say, you know, let's, let's manage these beaver conflicts in a different way, especially flooding. And their, their solution to that is this thing called a flow device. In Skip's case, it's called a, a beaver deceiver. It's basically this pipe and fence system that passes water through the dam and regulates the height of the pond. So you can say, hey, you know, I like having these beavers here. I appreciate all the good they're doing for the ecosystem, but, you know, I don't want to snorkel through my, my backyard <laughs> and, you know, have, have Microskip uh, install one of these, these flow devices and basically strike a compromise, a, a water level that's acceptable, ideally, to both rodent and human being. Okay, so in our region, in New England, roughly speaking, you don't have to have specific numbers of beavers, but how are they doing? Are, are, are they back? Are they as big a population? as when the colonists first came here and started trapping and killing them? No, they're not. They're not quite that big, but they're but they're doing pretty well. I mean, I mean, the issue now is that you know we've de- we've developed so much habitat, right? We've we've drained so many wetlands, we've paved over, you know, so many floodplains and, and occupied former beaver habitat. You know, it's there's no way that beavers will ever return to their former abundance in, in New England. But you know, their populations are pretty robust in in most of the region. You know, certainly Massachusetts. Most of Massachusetts is pretty is pretty close to biological carrying capacity, I would say. Most of the, most of the good habitats are, are occupied at this point, which is fantastic. You know, I think that New England's a, a great beaver success story. We've, we have a lot of, a lot of water here, unlike, unlike the West, where beaver populations are still pretty low. So we're, we're closer to full occupancy. But there are still lots of places where beavers, again, are just reflexively trapped out every time they cause a problem. I think that there are opportunities to get beavers back in, in some streams and wetlands in close proximity proximity to humans. You know, there are ways of addressing these problems and and, uh, helping beavers out still more in New England. So you've made such a great case for beavers as balancers of ecosystems and master builders. It's a fascinating species, but I just want want you to end on just some cool things about beavers that people don't know. I mean, this the stuff that people who really care about these animals will tell people, I, I don't know, at a, at a bar or something. Did you know this about beavers? Okay, <laughs> tell us some stuff. Yeah, I'm always impressed by how well beavers are adapted to this really unique niche they have, right? I mean, they spend you know so much of their time in the water. It stands to reason they have some great sort of evolutionary adaptations to living in water. So, for example, they have this second set of transparent eyelids that they can close over their eyes that basically act as goggles underwater. They have a second set of fur-lined lips they can close behind their teeth so they can they can chew and drag branches underwater without getting water down their throats. Uh, and, you know, and they also have this really unique diet, right? They're, you know, they're eating the inner bark of, of trees, which is, a, you know, some pretty hard stuff to, to digest. So they end up eating their own poop, basically, to, to give their guts uh, kind of a second chance at, at getting every last dollop of nutrients out of their out of their fecal matter. So I think, you know, they, they've got some pretty cool adaptations for the, to this very unique life they have. Ben Goldfarb is an environmental journalist. He's the author of Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. You can find an excerpt of this book on nextnewengland.org. Ben, as always, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Lily Tyson produces Next. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. Our digital producer is Carlos Mejia. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. Hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. 
The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with support from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York and the Melville Charitable Trust. It's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and Connecticut Public Radio.